Praise God. So if you need a bulletin, please, please raise your hand. And the gentlemen that are walking down the aisle will hand you an outline for our service today. Friends, I was a teenager and I remember watching TV. And I remember seeing a statistic on TV that said something like, by the year 2050, the population in the United States that is older than 65 will be very large. And I thought, man, I, I, I like old people, you know, no problem. I will get along with them, no problem. And then I started doing the math. And I realized that by 2050, I would be 68. So that was talking about me, right? That was talking about me. We, we so often think that our lives will be forever. We sing a song that says, Life is but a fleeting breath, a sigh to breathe to measure. And that's true, isn't it? We blink and we're 40. We blink again and we die. No, <laughs> not exactly like that. But it's quick. Life is brief. We live 70, 80, 90 years, and we're gone. So if our lives are so brief, how do we make them count? How do we do something with it? The Bible calls Christians to, within our lifespan, abound in good works, walk in good works, be zealous, for good works, to model good works. So how good are your works? Perhaps you are stuck in an average job and you feel like you are just such an average person. So how could you produce good works? Or perhaps you're so busy with the affairs of a large family that is demanding and, and you feel like you're barely surviving so you simply don't have time for good works perhaps you think you you just don't have the capacity and the giftings that others have so let others do good works because your good works just aren't that good well let me submit to you that these things are lies the devil wants you to believe them because the devil wants you to waste your life. But God wants you to believe him so that you may walk on the good works that he has already prepared for you. God has called you, God has equipped you, and God has placed you exactly what you need to be in order to flourish in good works. Every Christian that is indwelled by the Holy Spirit is given spiritual gifts that should be used for the edification of the church, for the good of others. So if you are a Christian, you are called and equipped for every good work. Today we're going to look at the example of a young man named Timothy and how the Apostle Paul and others poured into his life to equip him to carry on the church. In Philippians 2, right after the passage that Edward read to us this morning, the Apostle Paul actually speaks of Timothy as an example of a Christ-like young man. Here's what he says in Philippians 2, 20 through 22. For I have no one like him, like Timothy, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, right, the false teachers, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. So how, how did Timothy get to be so great? A young pastor that Paul's considered his own son, who, who, who is, whose quality that, that is forever written in the word of God is one of proven worth. 
And their answer must be, Timothy is so great because of the grace of God. There is no mathematical accuracy. There is no 2 plus 2 equals 4 when it, com when it comes to raising godly young men and young women in the life of the church. God's grace is what accomplishes it. But perhaps a better question would be this, and this is going to be our guiding question for today. What are the means of grace that God used to lead Timothy to be a godly young man? Because if we understand the means of grace that God has used to raise a godly young man like Timothy, right? We can pursue the same means of grace and raise T.J. Chipman, right? Who led us in such a humble and godly way into prayer today. So in our passage today, we're going to see three things. I'm going to give them to you now. So you understand my outline, and then I'm going to go back, and I'll give them to you again as I go through the passage. We're going to see the impact of discipleship. We're also going to see the influence of godly families. And then we're going to see the importance of scriptures. If these are the means of grace that God makes available, these are the means of grace that you can use today to abound in good works, and to invest in the lives of folks in our very church. Two things before we go into the text. This is not primarily a parenting message. Although I will mention some things about parenting, this is a message about how a covenantal church community works together to bring children up who love God and believe that Jesus Christ is their Savior. If you're a member of Sheridan Hills Baptist Church, you have agreed to our covenant. And listen to what our covenant says. We also engage to maintain family and private devotions, to build healthy biblical marriages, to biblically educate our children. You have agreed to this. And I don't think this is only referring to your own children, right? This is a corporate document. I think this is saying we as a church agree to raise the children that are within our community in the Bible, in the word of the Lord. So if you're a member of our church today, I'm going to help you be faithful to the covenant that you have agreed upon, to the covenants that you are upholding. Also, for the sake of time, I am not going to read the text in the beginning, but I will read the text as I preach the text. So first, as we go into 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, let us consider the impact of discipleship. Paul says to his young pupil, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly, a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Paul begins the, the, the section in the letter by telling Timothy not to not be like some other people, right? He says, you, however, and who are they? These are, these are teachers that are deceiving the flock that have come into the church. These are the false teachers. Paul is saying, do not be like them. This is Paul's last letter. His last words. He's in prison and knows he will die soon. He's concerned that the church of Ephesus, where he had been an elder for three years, would follow false teachers 
So he tells Timothy, don't follow them. Continue, continue following me instead. Paul is about to put in front of us his pattern for discipleship. So if we want to learn what discipleship looks like, well, well let's, let's see what Paul says here. How, how has Paul discipled Timothy? In verses 10 through 13, we'll see that Paul discipled Timothy through his doctrine, through his life, and through his suffering. He says in verse 10, you have followed my teaching. The word follow here actually can be rendered, you have investigated my teaching. It's the, it's the same word that, that Luke uses to say how carefully he examined the evidence of the life of Jesus in order to write his gospel. Luke was a historian. Luke, Luke was, a, was a careful observer. Paul says that Timothy has observed the life of Paul in the same way that Luke observed the life of Jesus. You have followed, you have observed, you have investigated my teaching. Timothy followed Paul so closely that, it's, that it was as though he was investigating him. Friends, discipleship takes time. If we're going to raise a next generation of Christians at Sheridan Hills, we, we must be willing to give up of our time so that younger folks may investigate our lives. Discipleship takes vulnerability. We must be willing to let people into our lives, both our strengths and our weaknesses, so that they may know how a seasoned saint walks with the Lord. Time. Do you dedicate time to discipleship? Do you have others around you that are learning to walk with the Lord as they investigate your life? We, we are of a culture that, that often does not give time much importance, right? I often hear said of musicians, wow, he's such a great musician, such great talent. Let me tell you something. A musician doesn't get to be great because of talent. A musician gets to be great because he or she spends time with their instruments, right? So, so it's not about talent. Talented musicians are limited. Musicians that work hard have no limits to what they can do. So likewise, discipleship is not about talent. It's not about how well you know how to disciple others. It's not this, this thing that only a few people have. Discipleship is about dedicating time, being available, being present. Discipleship takes place in the life of the local church. How will you disciple others if your time here with us starts at 1042 and ends at 1215? No, Get into the life of the church, get plugged in, and spend time. Be vulnerable. Paul says, you have followed my teaching. You can fill this in. This is his doctrine. Not just actions, right? Actions speak louder than words. Words speak as well, right? Not just actions, but words. Christianity is faithful, you can feel this in, as long as it follows the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. We don't say when we're talking about the Bible, to me, this means. We seek to understand what the author means and follow their teaching. Paul said, you, Timothy, have investigated my teaching. 
Timothy has investigated the apostolic teaching of the Bible. Discipleship begins with teaching. But Paul also goes on to describe not only his doctrine, but also his life. You can fill this in. As an example for Timothy to follow. Look back at verse 10. He says, not only my teaching, but also my conduct, my aim, my life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Sound doctrine without godly life is legalism. I know, but I don't live it. These are, these are two sides of a coin that can never be separated. Keep watch of your teaching and of your life. We're called to glorify God both in word but also in deed. Feel this in? Christian discipleship has to do with what we say but also with what we do. And friends, children will know if we really live what we preach. I mean, we, we, can, we can hide a little bit, right? But children are way more perceptive than we think. And there's nothing more harming to the next generation of Christians than older Christians who preach the Bible but live like the world. Yet there's nothing more edifying to the next generation of Christians than Christians who preach the Bible and seek to faithfully live out the, world, the, the word. In verse 11, now Paul shifts the subject a little bit. You see that? He now begins to talk about his suffering. He said all these things about what he has done. Right? My, my conduct, my faith, my life, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. And then he puts two words together. My persecutions and sufferings. He says, my persecutions and sufferings that happened at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. Which persecutions I endured. These persecutions are actually, you, you can go and read about them during Paul's first missionary trip. They're in Acts 13 and 14. Maybe you should go read those chapters later on today. And, um, but but here's, what, here's what Paul is modeling here to Timothy. Christian discipleship is not primarily about our strength, but very much about our weakness. Paul is not trying to hide his suffering to his disciple, but instead he wants to display it. In 2 Corinthians, he says that God's power is made perfect, not in our strength, but in our weakness. This is great news. You don't have to be strong to lead others to Christ. You can be weak. This means we all qualify as disciples. Who is weak? We all are. You know that. As a matter of fact, weakness is better than strength for discipleship. Because it is through weakness that we truly experience the power of God. Paul pleaded with God three times, remove this thorn from me. But he experienced the grace of God, not in the removal of God, of, of, of the thorn. But he experienced the grace of God in that God gave him grace to walk through his suffering. Paul talks about his persecution and his suffering, and then he lists three places he went through during his first mission, missionary journey. Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And, and this is important because Timothy was from Lystra. Paul was beaten, stoned, and left for dead. And this was the example that he wanted Timothy to follow. 
You know, I, I, I've been watching some of the presidential debates that have happened in the past few days. And one thing that no one in those debates wants to display is their weakness. Have you noticed that? There is no boasting in weakness. That the goal of presidential debates are often, let me show how strong I am and how weak my opponent is. Let me boast on how great I am. Let me tell you what I have done. And let me tell you how the guy across from me has done nothing. I watch those debates and I see people swimming in their pride. That's the opposite of what Christian discipleship is. Christian discipleship is when we're able to say, I am not strong, but let me point you to the one who is. Christian discipleship is able to say, any good that is within me comes from God, so he is great. And any weakness that is within me should point you to God as well. You know, uh, parenting has made me realize how, how weak I am. You know, how, how not able to console my son sometimes I am. And, and I know he doesn't understand this yet, but I have begun saying to him, Son, I can't help you right now, but Jesus can. I don't want him to remember when I started saying that. That's why I've started saying that. I want him to always know that. I want you to know that Jesus can help you, even when daddy can't. That is Christian discipleship. He says, Paul says, which persecutions I endured. Great persecutions. Yet from them all, the Lord rescued me. We are not too strong to handle what the world gives us, but God is. Christian discipleship is, is about suffering well. Did you hear TJ praying for that? Christian discipleship is not about not suffering, but suffering well. It's about suffering with faith, trusting that the Lord is in control, trusting that the Lord is for you and not against you, and that he will ultimately deliver us from all our troubles. Paul is saying this, right, knowing that he will soon die. He says, my life is being poured out as an offering. Yet he says, the Lord has delivered me from all sufferings, from all my persecutions. How? Ultimately, through his faith in Jesus Christ, which assured him, right, eternal life. That is the Christian hope. So a few months ago, TJ and I went to visit a dying saint in the life of the church. We sat there with this dying lady and we read psalms we prayed with her we loved her we heard about her walk with the lord and we walked away remember and i remember thinking and what an encouragement it is to see a saint dying well and i thought how important it is for tj to be here acquainted with this kind of suffering at this age. Friends, don't let us not hide the real suffering of this life from our children. Let us not shelter our children from knowing that this world, in this world, will have trouble. Because we can only point them to the one who has overcome this world if they know that this world is filled with tribulation. Don't be afraid of talking with the younger folks, about the reality of this world. Christian discipleship is realistic. In this world, you have trouble, but take heart. Verses 13 and 14, Paul goes on to make a general statement about the Christian experience. He says, verse 12, or verse 13, uh, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life, I'm sorry, verse 12, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. What is common to every Christian is that everyone who seeks to live a godly life 
will suffer, will be persecuted. Things will go from bad to worse, right? Evil people and imposters will become more deceitful, even to the point that they will begin deceiving themselves. So a major part of discipling the young in teach, is teaching them how to suffer for their faith. Persecution is increasing, okay? It is. But, but, but it is here now, right? We, we shouldn't look for persecution, but if it comes our way, we should not shy away from it. So if, I've made the calculations, if my son lives to be 82, he will see the next century. And then my mind goes, what will be the world like in the year 2000? What is it? 21,000 and one. What will, be the world, what will the world be like? We must prepare our young ones to suffer and suffer well. Perhaps you're saying, I don't really get persecuted as a Christian. I, I don't know what this persecution you're talking about is, Lucas. Uh, I, I live a pretty quiet life. Well, let me challenge you to do something. Start sharing the gospel. Start preaching the gospel. Grab a microphone and a little speaker and go down to South Beach and start proclaiming the excellencies of Christ. <laughs> Friends, if you're not experiencing persecution as a Christian, that, that's not a good thing. That, that means you need to wake up. And understand that the days are evil. That means you need to be proclaiming the gospel. And you need to be preaching the gospel to others. And you need to, you need to experience rejection. If you want to be acquainted with the one who was despised. Preach the gospel and you see the persecution in the world. Live a godly life and you see the persecution in the world. It's encouraging, on the other hand, to see how, how our church is is raising young men and women. You see how many people ra uh, got up to, to, and we acknowledge them as volunteers to family camp? The week before that, you know, we had a youth camp. But you know that our ministry to children runs year-round. Did you know that? So perhaps some of you were so motivated with camp, family camp and youth camp that, that you ought to consider doing that all year, all year round. Equipping the young saints to run their race well. Yes, this is how we disciple the next generation. Friends, God has designed the local church to be the place where the next generation of believers is equipped to withstand the outside pressures of the world. In the church, your weakness will be strengthened by others. In the church, your children will witness true worship. Here they will see that they're not alone in this counter-cultural walk that is called Christianity. The church complements the home in an indispensable way. Yet this leads us to our next point. The church complements the home. So now let's consider the influence of godly families. In verses 14 through 15, Paul says, But as for you, Timothy, continuing what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Paul once again contrasts what the false teachers do with what Timothy should do. But as for you, continue or abide, remain, hold on. It is a call for perseverance. Hold on to what? To the gospel you were taught from childhood. It's interesting. T Timothy was one of the first second generation Christians we know of. 
Back in, in 2 Timothy, in the same book, chapter 1, verse 5, Paul shed some light into Timothy's Christian upbringing. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, right, of Timothy, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Louis, and your mother, Eunice, and now, I am sure, dwells in you as well. We don't know a lot about Timothy's home, but we know some. We don't know if his father was dead or he was simply a non-believer. But, but we know that Paul viewed Timothy as his own son. But we know that his grandmother and his mother, and his mother raised him in the faith raised him in the Word of God. It's interesting because perhaps some of you have a testimony that's similar to mine. I was raised in a Christian home. I was not born a Christian, yet there was no point in my life where I went from not believing that the Word of God was the Word of God to believing that the Word of God was the Word of God, right? I always believed that the Bible was the Word of God. My conversion was an experience of going from, but that's not for me, to that's speaking of me, right? So Timothy was raised in a similar manner. He was raised in a home where the word of God was upheld as the highest authority. Most converts to Christianity are children who were raised in Christian homes. If faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God, a home where the Word of God is often spoken is a home where children will more likely be raised to have faith. It's interesting. Have you ever seen LeBron James' son play basketball? He's amazing. Why? Because basketball is a priority at the James' home. What about Will Smith's son, Jaden? He's only, he's only 20 and has starred on several blockbusters. Why? Because acting is a priority at the Smith's home. In my own family, all three of my siblings have pursued music professionally. Why? Because music in my home has been a priority Friends, what is your priority? What, what are the priorities of your households? What, what you prioritize at your home will likely become a priority in the lives of your children. What first dwells in you will likely also dwell in your children. What are the priorities of your home? What do you spend most of your time doing? What do you spend most of your resources doing? What do you talk about the most? What do your children see you doing once you come home from work? Do they see a devotion to God, a faith that is robust, that is alive? What first dwells in you will likely dwell in your children. The Bible says in Luke 6, 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. What do you speak to your children about? What are the words that come out of your mouth? In other words, we live out the principles we cherish the most. And what were the principles that were cherished at Timothy's home? Look at verse 15. And how from childhood you have, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Timothy's mother and grandmother knew the word of God and taught the word of God. Christian parents must know, fill this in, the Word of God and teach 
the word of God to their children. To be a good parent, you don't just need to know the verses on the, the Bible speaks on parenting. Actually, there are not many, that many verses that speak on parenting. But if you know God through his word, the whole Bible will speak to you about parenting. Because there's nothing better for your parenting to know, truly know God the good father. And to know how he loves those who are his. You don't just need the practical verses, right? Because the Bible doesn't contain practical and impractical verses. Everything in the Bible is profitable. Everything in the Bible is instructing you how to live godly lives. Everything in the Bible is teaching you how to lead others around you into godliness. Christian parents must know the Word of God, not just a few verses. Must understand the Bible and how the Bible comes together. And Christian parents must teach the Word of God to their children. Why? Because they need a few tips on parenting so they won't stink as bad as parents? No. It's because the Bible is able to make one wise for salvation. You see? Do you desire that your children will come to know God? Know the word of God first. And then teach it to them. In other words, the best thing you can do to lead your children from eternal condemnation to eternal salvation is to know God and to teach your children who God is. And how does salvation work? Look at the last words there in verse 15. Salvation is through faith in Christ Jesus. This is the best gift you can give your children is to understand that. I was recently talking to somebody that has come into the life of the church. This person has grown up in a Christian home. And this person told me, I, I, I knew God. I knew who God was. I grew up knowing God who God was. I grew up reading the Bible. But it wasn't until recently that I came to understand that you truly know God through Jesus. We come to the Father through Jesus, His Son. Friends, God in His holiness is completely set apart from you. He's completely devoted to Himself. He, he, he is completely inaccessible to us because our sinful nature, our sinful bodies would be utterly destroyed in the presence of all holy God. We can't come to God. God is not accessible to us. And that's actually for our own good so that we are not destroyed. We can only come to God through faith. Through faith in Jesus. Amen. The message of the gospel, the message that we must uphold to the next generation of believers, the message that, that when we don't preach and we don't repeat over and over and over again gets forgotten is the message that, that it's not about our own doing, but it's about the doing of Christ. It's about the one who came and lived the life that we could not have lived and offered it to us as an exchange. This is the message of the gospel. Friends, playing the piano is a wonderful thing. Playing soccer is, is a wonderful thing. Getting straight A's, learning mathematics, learning how to read and write are wonderful things. But none of those things will lead you to heaven. Only faith in Jesus Christ will lead you to heaven. It's teaching the gospel a priority in your home. It's teaching the gospel to your children a priority in your home. 
Do we uphold the teaching that is salvation is a gift of God that we can only access through faith in Jesus Christ? Do we uphold that in our church? We must. So that our children will not just be good citizens of this country, but they will be good citizens of heaven. What matters for a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Friend, God in his holiness is set apart. Set apart because we were born in sin and because we chose sin. And we still choose it day after day. But by his grace, but God sent forth his son who lived a perfect life. He was born under the law to fulfill the law that we could not have fulfilled. So that by faith, we would receive the righteousness that Christ offers. Not the righteousness that we accomplish. Because our righteousness is filthy apart from Christ. Friends the, friends, the message of the gospel is that through salvation, through faith and salvation that Jesus Christ offers, we can come to the Lord. Do you desire your children to come to the Lord more than you desire them to learn how to read and write? Then put more emphasis on the message of the gospel in your home than you put on, make, on doing homework. Then you put on athletics. Then you put on vacation. Then you put on technology. Let us uphold the gospel before our children. The church of tomorrow depends on this. Thirdly, we're going to see the importance of scriptures in verses 16 through 17. Paul goes on to say, All scriptures breathe out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the men of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So just as a review, remember that we, we set out this message uh, from the beginning to answer this question. What are the means of grace that God used to lead Timothy, Timothy to be a godly young man? And we saw the personal, relation, the personal discipleship is one mean of grace, and, and we also saw that godly families are, is another mean of grace. But now, we see that God himself gives grace through his own word. This is one of the most important passages in the entire Bible about the Bible. The Bible tells us two things. What the Bible is, and what the Bible does. So look first at, at what the Bible is, what Scripture is. Paul coins a term here that has never been used anywhere else in Greek literature. Biblical or non-biblical. He says that all Scripture is theopneustos, meaning God-breathed. So, so, so Scripture is the breath of God. When God speaks, He speaks Scripture. This is a very high view of what Scripture is. Scripture does not only contain the Word of God. Scripture is the Word of God. Scripture is what comes out of the mouth of God. In other words, in other words when the Bible speaks, God speaks. Scripture is is God's prophetic word for you today. So if somebody comes up to you and tells you, I have a prophetic word for you, you ask them, what's the chapter and what's the verse? <laughs> if they don't have a chapter or a verse, don't listen to them. Listen to God instead. Here's how Peter puts it in 2 Peter 1.20. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is God who produces prophecy. And God's complete, perfect, prophetic word to us today is written down in the 66 books of the Bible. 
Scripture is the word of God. And godliness grows as we grow in knowledge and understanding and practice of the word of God. Are you struggling with sin? Read the word of God. Are you struggling with faith, assurance? Read the word of God. Are you struggling with spiritual apathy? Read the word of God. But in verse 16, Paul goes on to explain not only what Scripture is, but also what Scripture does. Scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So there are four words here, right? Kind of like there are four wheels in the car that uphold the car, right? Scripture is upheld by these four pillars. There is a positive aspect to Scripture, right? It teaches and it trains in righteousness. I want you to circle the words teaches and trains. This means when we don't know what to do, Scripture informs us and enables us to do what is right. He teaches and trains. But there's also a negative aspect to what Scripture does, right? Scripture also reproves and corrects. Now, I want you to underline these two words because I want, to, I want you to see that they're related. Un underline reproves and corrects. This means when we don't know what we should do, Scripture, or, or when we do what we shouldn't do, excuse me, Scripture informs and enables us to change. You know, I was going through some books that were donated to, I guess, to me in the church office. Um, and, uh, and, and I was, I was flipping through several of them. And I came across a title that kind of caught my attention. Yeah, the title was this, Have a New Kid by Friday. Uh, I, I looked at it on Friday, so I was like, today or, or next week? <laughs> I wasn't sure. You know, I thought, man, I mean... I'm, Perhaps this book will teach me how to sleep train my son. I mean, I really need that. Have a new kid by Friday. What, what a great promise. How to change your child's attitude, behavior, and character in five days. All right. That's a bold promise. Well, I flipped through the pages, and, and I actually put the book away because those are empty promises. The book itself said it could not deliver on its promise. Right? That's not how it works, right? Children don't change because we have a first step, second step, third step, right? So, so, so if you do the ABCs of children changing, you accomplish the change in the hearts of your children. That's not how change works. Change comes as the Holy Spirit enlightens the hearts of children that know the Word of God, right? They're taught the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit convince, convinces them this Word is from God to you and enables them to then change, right? Ch change is not from without. Change is from within, right? So, so, so it is the heart of the children that matters, it is the heart of the children that matters. And how are the hearts of children changed? Only God can do that. But we, we can teach them the truth. So the Spirit may work with the truth that we teach them from Scripture so that when they do what they shouldn't do, they are reproved and corrected. By us, sure, but ultimately by the Holy Spirit. And that is when change is complete for children. Friends, look around. Look into the faces of the younger folks around you. If, if your children are sitting by you, 
Look at them. What, what legacy do you desire to leave for them? Do we desire to leave for them cars, houses, jobs, money, sports, vacations? What do we seek to leave behind for them? They don't ultimately need these things. Do you know what they need? They need God. Do you have God? Do you have God? Give them God so that they may, may be complete for every good work. They need the word of God so that they may know God and so that they may know not to stray into the world, but to walk in godliness. Friends, the days we are living in today are evil. Men and women do not want to know the Lord. If we do nothing, neither will our children. But if we truly disciple the next generation, if we live out our faith at home, if we live out our faith in the church, if we uphold the word of God, tomorrow's church will be filled with men and women who know God and who, and who experience His grace. So I conclude with this. What is the hope for tomorrow's church? The hope of tomorrow's church is that by the grace of God, you and I invest our lives to proclaim the word of God to the people of God that is coming after us. So let us do that. Let us live in faithfulness to God and to his church. Would you pray with me?